we're going to have a chat to John C. Wright about his new book, Transhuman and Subhuman, on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. Thank you for joining us today on the Sci-Fi Show, John C. Wright. You've just put a, a new book out that's a collection of essays, Transhuman and Subhuman. How'd you, how'd you come to put together a collection of essays like that? The collection of essays ranges from every topic that interests me, which is generally every topic under the sun. But for those essays particularly, I have things like a movie review of the second Hobbit movie, which I abhorred, a meditation on the, the transhumanist theory that we're going to evolve into fears that will be downloaded into a computer or something, a general idea, general essays on other political topics and religious topics and science fiction topics, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in the overlap between science fiction and philosophy. Because if you think about it, science fiction is actually the most philosophical of all the genres because speculation is at the core of what science fiction stands for. As to how I came to write these, I had been a newspaper man for many a year back in the day, back before I got a steady job, and more honest, more honest work, I should say. The editor gave me space on the editorial page, so the best job in the world for an opinionated man is for someone to pay you to give your opinion. In addition to being paid for giving my opinions, what happened is I got bitten by the pen bug. I had to write down my opinions of things. It, was, it became a habit like scratching an itch. So a friend of mine introduced me to Live Journal, and for about 10 years now, I've been maintaining a Live Journal, and I write between one and four essays, columns a week of various sizes on any topic that strikes my fancy, merely to get the, merely to get the itch out of my system. Well, about two months ago, out of the blue, uh, a man named Theodore Beal, who runs a publishing house in some northern European country whose name I can't remember, Swedenborg maybe, or uh, Finhaven. You can tell I'm an American, of course, because I don't know of any, of any other countries but my own. <laughs> I'll put it this way. It's a country not in Her Majesty's Commonwealth, so we, don't care. we English speakers don't care about it. So Theodore Beale writes to me and says, do you have any material, do you have any material that, that, I can, that I can publish, we can make money off of? And I said, well, a complete stranger, not only do I have material, I have a, I have a whole raft of material, stuff that I've already written, and if you give me a, a few days to uh, whip it into ship shape, then we, we can float it. And he said, stop with, this, with, the, with the boat metaphors already, okay, English-speaking person. I said, fine. So he reprinted some of my old short stories, including one that had been reprinted more than once in Year's Best Anthology. So it was really some of the best things I had written. And it got a tremendously positive response just within a few days of people going, this is the best thing I've ever read, and, and, and going, uh, this is better than Herman Melville and better than, than Leo Tolstoy. And that, was, and that was just my mom saying that. Okay. So he then said, what about nonfiction? I said, I have 10 years' worth of material of you know, 400 or so on essays per year, so I've got like 4,000 essays. I, I'll, I can whip you up something. And so he put together an extremely handsome cover for me, and we did some editing, and I got, and let me tell you, I got fans of mine, this, not, not my mom, but my actual other, other fans, that I, I don't have to pay that much to be my fans. These people volunteered out of the blue to read the essays and to type edit them for me. And so it's like 10 people. I put a notice on my blog. I said, hey, does anyone want to read my essays that I've already given you guys for free so I can sell them in a book that you guys will later buy? At first, I was going to cut myself off with like 10, and then 20 people volunteered and said, sure, we'd love to do back-breaking labor for you for no reason. And I said, okay. And that's how the book got, got put together. There was a brief discussion as to which essay should go first and what the, what, what the book should be named. But other than that, it is a reprint of material that was already there like fresh fruit ready for the right for the plucking. I must say, I really enjoyed the collection of essays. Your, your essay on your uh, unbounding love for the genius that is the desolation of Smaug was very entertaining. Uh, um, you really didn't like it, did you? <laughs> I, I, I disliked it so intensely that in my house we now have the stupidity hammer, which comes out of the screen and hits you over the head uh, hard enough to stun you and make your eyes look at each other over the broken bridge of your nose has become a byword. 
in my, in my <laughs> app. We now refer to things in terms of how many units of desolation of smog it would take to equal the humidity <laughs> of that. So it's like, you know, zero, one, two, five, and then about 10 is desolation of smog level. Uh, Plan 9 from outer space is nine smog units, and uh, Starship Troopers, the movie, is about eight smog units in terms of how... I love Starship I love Starship I love Star I like the book. The movie. the movie was the exact opposite of the book, made by someone who hated the book and was trying this to mock true. people like me who are fans of the book. Now, if you've never read that's the book, true. that's fine, because you thought, you probably saw a movie that you thought was just a takeoff on old, old-fashioned science fiction bug, bug fighting movies. Now, keep in mind, the desolation of smog scale that we have here in my house is not to say whether you enjoyed the movie or not. It's just to say how stupid it is. A thing can be really stupid and still be enjoyable. In fact, it can be stupid and awesome. And in my house, we've coined a new word called awesome, which is both stupid and awesome. I can't think of an example. Have you of seen it. Have you seen Sharknado? Common Riders. I haven't seen Sharknado, but that might that might qualify. Uh, one of my boys says that Common Riders are, are stupid and awesome. You might definitely enjoy the movie Sharktopus. Well, keep in mind, you're the one who enjoyed Starship Troopers the movie, which in my house I will not even call Starship Troopers. I call it Bug Wars. <laughs> but you can call I that. That's find, fair enough. I did find a guy who hated the movie more than me, and I thought that that was impossible. This was a guy who used to work for the Disney Company, and he had been a scriptwriter in in Hollywood, and he did a treatment for. Robert Heinlein's Double Star that he was going to try to get made into a movie. But when Starship Trooper bombed, it killed his career. So he said, not only did I hate everything about that movie, the same thing as you hate, <laughs> but it also killed my career, so I hate it more. So I only hate this movie a second to the bottom of the pile of people who hated this movie, <laughs> not the first. Coming back slightly, you, you didn't like The Desolation of Smaug. Fair enough. I, I, haven't got, I haven't got around to seeing it yet. What did you think of the original Lord of the Rings trilogy that that's my uh, favorite Peter book. Jackson did. Far and away my favorite book of all time. Because here's what Tolkien was trying to do, and I think he succeeded. The modern novelists departed from their romantic roots. And when I say the modern novelists, I'm talking about 1800s, 1830s, thereabouts. The modern novelists attempted to interject what's kind of erroneously called realism into, into books to get rid of supernatural elements or unlikely coincidences, what we call Dickens-like coincidences, and so on and so forth. Now, what, what Tolkien did is he took the ambitions of these modern novelists and he did them one better. He invented his own entire secondary world, and, but described it in the detail and with the motivations and with the, as if he had counted the number of steps on the march of each aspect of his invented world. So he actually did do what the modern novelists who were sneering at him for being a throwback tried to do and failed to do. If you, re if you read uh, Ulysses by James Joyce and you read it right next to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you tell me which one of those is actually more realistic and has more to do with the way real life is really lived. And I would say that Lord of the Rings actually will speak to you more deeply and have more pertinent things to say about the problems that would come up in your life and in mine than reading about Harold Bloom in turn of the century uh, Ireland. Belfast, wherever he is. Okay. What do you think of Peter Jackson's treatment uh, the first time around with the first trilogy of movies? Uh, I'm a bit of a purist, so every even slightest, tiniest deviation from the uh, the book annoyed me disproportionately. And in Fair enough. Just an emotion that I call geek rage. But being a apprentice Vulcan, I'm able to put my emotions aside and say that in terms of craftsmanship, he did one of he did perhaps the most expert version of translating a book to the silver screen that you could do. He made one or two missteps with my favorite characters of Theoden and Faramir, and especially Aragorn, I believe, was, was terribly miscast. I thought they had a, a weak-looking kind of beta wolf male for, for Aragorn. He should have been an alpha wolf. He should have been a... He should have looked like a Bogart, Humphrey Bogart. He should look like Humphrey Bogart. He should look like a weather-beaten fellow who, who slept under rocks and who had a tough look in his eye. I mean, it was... Bruce Willis would have been a better Aragorn than uh, the guy they picked, v Vitio Morgenstern or whatever his name is. Yep. So okay. I didn't like the casting for that. Everything else, let me, let me hasten to say, everything else was done perfectly. The art direction was perfect. The look of the film, perfect. The, the fact that they got the real Sam and the real Gandalf to play the parts in the movies, perfect. The casting for them was, was, was perfect. He managed to make a spiritual danger of the one ring, the, the ring that corrodes your mind and soul, 
communicate to the audience just through visual images, by, by, by small things like having the ring drop with a heavy thud when, when it first falls to the floor, by having Gandalf sit with his back to it, unwilling to move or look at it for fear the temptation will overwhelm him. Things like that. Oh, yes. And it's hard to do, because remember with, with film, you don't have the flexibility you have with a book. With a book, I can tell you what the person's thinking. With a movie, the words either have to be said out loud or written down, or there has to be a visual image that will immediately project to the reader to the viewer, in this case, to the viewer, what, what's going on. So something like the look of Minas Tirith has to be perfect. The look of the, the volcano, Mount Doom, has to be perfect. See? And I think he did that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him uh, as high a praise as a purist like me can give. Okay. But I, I think that the idea of Faramir was betrayed. I think the idea of Denethor's rather dignified death was turned into a ridiculous flaming swan dive off of the top of the Tower of the Guard. That was ridiculous. I don't think Peter Jackson understands nobility. I don't think he understands warfare. I think he has kind of a Anglo-American view of war as a rather negative thing, and I, don't, I think if the movie had been done by a, a Japanese guy or a British guy from the, from the Victorian age, they would have actually portrayed the nobility of Aragorn and what was going on in the war more correctly, and they would have left in the scouring of the Shire without which the movie, the whole story kind of doesn't have a proper uh, period, doesn't actually come to a, the proper point that it was trying to make. Casting Christopher Lee as Saruman was a stroke of genius. Christopher <laughs> Lee is Saruman. That was great. Having the wizards fight by waving sticks in the air and flying old men on wires around a room was about the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And that's when the stupidity hammer first hit me in my, in my life was that scene. Okay, so... In your collection of essays, one of the recurring themes is what you think science fiction is for, what you think it functions as as a as a medium, what it's good for. You commented earlier that you thought it was a well, it was a good medium for philosophical storytelling, and I just said it was more philosophical than pirate stories, romance stories, well, okay. stories about samurai vampires, stories about railroads, stories about stories about the old west. I, I mean, the, the part of science fiction that, that, that I myself come from, I write space operas, so I'm more likely to write something that's going to be like A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, where a naked guy with a sword is going to beat up a dinosaur from one pole to another of an astronomically impossible planet to get a space princess. So, that's, so let's, not, let's, not, let's not heap too much praise on science fiction. It is it's basically juvenile in its approach, but sometimes you can have sometimes more can grow out of that. But let's not forget our roots, our humble roots, our humble hard scrabble roots. Okay. I've always found it's good for telling stories with big ideas that you can't do in, I guess you might call a more realistic medium. Yeah. You can explore questions of, or particularly things like the philosophy of mind and things like that, that you can't even hope to do in, in more realistic storytelling, I suppose. I mean, even, I don't know what you thought of Total Recall, the movie, but for this big big action blockbuster Arnie movie yeah. running around and fighting and chasing and at the end of the movie there's this big idea which isn't it doesn't hit you over the head they did the same thing in Inception but not as well but they right at the end he's standing there he's saved Mars and everything's great and maybe he's still in the chair at recall and the girl says kiss, kiss me quick because this, this might be a dream she yeah he could, he could still be in the chair at recall and, yeah. Yeah. and it's just like wow you know <laughs> well that's, that's that's actually an excellent example. Because if you wanted to ask the question, what is the nature of reality? Or if you wanted to say, what would it be like if, a, if your main character doesn't, didn't think he was a human being? And it's a story that takes place in modern day Earth. The main character has to be insane. Okay? Because that's yeah. the only way to answer that question. But in a science fiction story, the person could be right. He could have been a shape changing alien who came to Earth and got hit over the head and had amnesia. He could be a, uh, you know, a kidnapped uh, person from a parallel dimension. He could be a, a vampire who accidentally got cured by a, uh, by a ruthless Roman Catholic priest or something. You know, there's any number of things he could be in a science fiction or fantasy background. Here's the one thing, the one thing that really makes science fiction and fantasy different from every other genre. Every, every good story has to have plot, character development, uh, story arc, themes, and those, those basics, right? But a science fiction story, in addition, also has to have good world building. The author has to make up, has to invent a parallel reality that is realistic enough to cast the spell, to cast the illusion, the glamour of reality in the mind of the, the willing reader. It's like the reader's trying to be hypnotized by the, by the storyteller. And it's harder to hypnotize the reader 
if you are saying things that are too ridiculous and too unbelievable. So you have to add a level of verisimilitude, an appearance of reality where there's no reality. The way science fiction does that is it tries to make its false to facts assumptions. Every, every science fiction story has one MacGuffin, one thing that doesn't fit into our world. Otherwise, it's not science fiction. And so you try to introduce that MacGuffin, and then you try to think through the realistic implications of it. Let me give you a, an example from what we just, we just said. When Frodo Baggins puts on the, the one ring and turns invisible, his clothes turn invisible too. But when Griffin the scientist from H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man turns invisible, his clothes do not turn invisible. What H.G. Wells does is he takes the same idea that we have in, in fairy stories of invisibility. It's one of the oldest ideas in the book. It goes back to the helmet of Pluto or the ring of Gyges. It goes all the way back to the earliest fairy tales, the earliest uh, epic stories. But as a science fiction writer now, and, and the father of science fiction in many ways, H.G. Wells says, well, what is the logical implications of invisibility? What could you actually use it for? Well, you couldn't wear clothes because they'd be visible, so you'd have to run around. If it snowed, you'd leave footprints. You probably would not be able to see because I'm not sure if the light would bounce off your retinas. And he just thought through many of the implications of this. And in his book, invisibility is only useful for terrifying people. <laughs> There's no good use yes. for it. See? But in a fairy tale, you have to use another type of logic to get the same feeling of verisimilitude. If you introduced questions like that to Lord of the Rings, it would break the spell. If Frodo said, hey, what happens if I pick up a knife once I'm invisible? Does it slowly turn invisible? Does it, if I took a button off my coat, now that I'm invisible, and I dropped it, would it become visible? That would break the spell. That would break the mood. See? So what, what you have to do with a fairy tale, which is what Tolkien was doing and doing masterfully, is make sure the dream logic works. The invisibility in Tolkien is because the One Ring is a thing of the world of darkness. It's from hell. It hides your identity. It hides your appearance. It's fundamentally deceptive. It's fundamentally a symbol of overbearing the will of others, which is why it can't be used for a good purpose. Even if Boromir were to put on the ring and perhaps even win the war against Sauron with it, because the ring doesn't do things like heal the sick and, <laughs> and raise the dead, it does things like break the willpower of other people and force nature and force other living things to do what you want, it's, it's infinitely corruptive. It's the corruption of power. Mm. It's absolute power, so it corrupts absolutely. But Tolkien does never say that, he just shows the side effects, the moods and the emotions of it, and our minds, our spirits, our imaginations fills in the rest and makes it seem realistic to us. That's how that works. One of the longest essays, and I would encourage people to get the book and have a read, you titled it Saving Science Fiction from Strong Female Characters. Mm. What's wrong with strong female characters in science fiction? Well, what's wrong with strong female characters in science fiction is that there's absolutely no reason whatsoever to save science fiction from strong female characters because we've always had strong female characters. <laughs> I mean, the very earliest uh, science fiction stories, uh, let, let's take the example of A Princess of Mars. If you've ever read it, it was written in like, I don't know, 1920, 1912, I forget when it was written. Mm -hmm. And there was not even science fiction magazines at the time. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs sold it to Argosy. And... The uh, Deja Thoris, the most beautiful woman of two worlds, is as stern as a Roman matron. She is all, and she's willing to die for her uh, city-state. She's completely unafraid, even when she's captured by savage, four-armed green Martians. And she is unwilling to break her vow uh, of marriage to a man she doesn't love, even though that would, even though her heart tells her uh, to go with the uh, the freakish Earth man. And it's often not noticed by people who read this charming action-adventure book. She's also a scientist. She was doing atmospheric tests to see how long Mars had to live before her, her, her uh, airship was shot down by the, by the green savages. So anyone, however, nowadays reading the book would probably be offended if she did not also whip out her kung fu action grip and deal death to the Martian savages who were attacking her. And in fact, when they made it into a movie, when they made John Carter of Mars into a movie a movie I had been waiting 100 years to see, because it was almost 100 years to the day after the book was written, in, when John Carter, the Virginia gentleman, steps in front of the, the lady to protect her and draws his sword as a stand-back man, she sneers at him, draws her own sword, and kicks all sorts of major butt, which modern women are supposed to be able to do. Now, I suggest in my essay that what's going on is that is not a strong female character, that is a strong male character in a female body, and if you wanted a strong female character, you'd have her, you'd have her act feminine. That is to say, you'd have her act with this particular strength and genius that women do really well and that men don't do well at all, instead of trying to have them act using the particular strength and the particular genius that men do really well, mainly men do it, not men like me, but that women look either awkward or terrible when they do it, you see? 
It's like, yes. why did John Carter go to Mars if Deja Thoris can, can beat up the, Martians or, the Green Martians herself? What is he there for? If she doesn't need a man, then she then write a story about her and don't put a man in it. Comedy relief? If she needs a man, then they can, then you can write a love story because people in love need each other. Okay? Yep. And that, in my mind, makes a much more memorable character. Let's look at the... We talked about Lord of the Rings before. Let's look at the character of Galadriel, the elf queen, in the Forbidden Forest. She is in no way, shape, or form a weak character. She's one of the main... Uh, I mean, she's one of the strongest characters in fiction. She is a magical being who can preserve her special protected domain against all the power of Sauron. She has one of the three rings. She has one of the three rings of the elven kind, and she's immortal, okay? But you don't see her wrestling alligators and ripping out their throats with her, with her pearly white teeth, and she's not trying to be the fighter in the group. Would it be fair to say the sort of strong female characters you think that science fiction doesn't need are the same sort of... I don't know. It's like the U.S. Marine Corps trying to get a whole lot of a cadre of female combat officers, and they just wash out, and they can't really do the job. So, making these characters is not true to life. Let me answer indirectly. Did you ever see Hayao Miyazaki's Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind? I haven't. I don't watch a lot of anime usually. Uh, well, this is as good as anything Disney ever did, and it's it's uh, a cut above every other anime. In fact, it's a cut above most other movies. Mr. Miyazaki is really a genius, and I strongly recommend. If you get nothing else out of this phone call. I strongly recommend you look up his movies, and your listeners do as well, because they're, they're really quite excellent. The craftsmanship of, of his work is perfect. The draftsmanship of his drawings is perfect. His ability to get a drama out of a situation is unparalleled. He's like Disney. Disney was a good storyteller. People have things they don't like about Disney, but you can't. no one, even people who hate him, cannot tell me that he was not a good storyteller, and Miyazaki is the same way. In any case, Nausicaa is, is a good example, and an unfortunate example I can't, I can't use with you. She's a... A princess in charge of her valley who is completely unafraid. In fact, she is more competent living in the toxic jungle, which is overrun with giant, mutated, monstrous insects, than because she tries to understand the critters rather than fight them. See, so the female approach, the female genius, which is to to try to, to try to get an insight into into your opposition and make them not your opposition anymore in that circumstance, is advantageous. She's as self-sacrificing as a, as a martyr at one point, and it takes considerable strength of character to be self-sacrificing because selfishness is more powerful than a dragon. Did you ever see uh, Gone with the Wind? Yes, once, okay. long ago. <laughs> you, should, you should watch it again if you want to understand how, how, how women think, or at least how American Southern women think. That Scarlett O'Hara is one of the strongest characters in the book. She's certainly much stronger than many of the men folk who are weak and vacillating in contrast. She falls in love with the one guy who's stronger, stronger willed than her, but it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out for them in the end. I'm sorry if I spoiled the surprise ending for, for anyone. And she doesn't karate chop anyone. She doesn't even browbeat anyone. Okay, men, not all men, but men tend to. They tend to be good at direct confrontational contest where there's a fight and a winner and a loser, and you get a rank and you get a grade. You shake hands, and that's it. Women are good at cooperative ventures where they try to get a, a family or a team or a group to form a consensus. And they try to find out what your real motives are. They tend to be more concerned, if they're, if they're feminine women, they tend to be more concerned with your motives than your task because, because they're usually in situations that are not emergencies and you don't need the task done now. But you do need, if you're raising a child, to get him to want to do the task because someday he's not going to be a child anymore, he's going to be grown up. And so it's almost a genetic programming which ought to make women behave this way if they're the, if they're the ones who are doing the primary child rearing. Whereas if the men are designed by nature or by nature's God, take your pick, for doing things like fighting, hunting, other direct, forceful, masculine tasks that have a, a beginning and an end and a, and a loser and a winner, then... That's the kind of stories you should tell to magnify that kind of character. But even then, if you want to tell a story about a woman who is a female warrior, they have been, there have been stories about that since the dawn of time. Camilla in the Aeneid is a martial maiden. A Britomart in Spencer's Fairy Queen and Brandomart, unless I'm confusing them, Brandomart in Ariosto. Oh, and the Amazons. Of course, the Amazons are Greek myths. are an entire race of warrior women. So there's nothing wrong with stories about that. I mean, I like, I like Wonder Woman stories myself perfectly fine. But I don't like stories where... A girl who looks like a fashion model can beat up a guy who looks like a linebacker unless you tell me that she's got a special genetic code that lets her do that or she's 
got the amulet of Agamata, or she's a mutant, or she's been trained, <laughs> or been trained by the by the Tibetan kung fu wizards, or something. You got to give my imagination something to hang on, because being a shallow guy, I don't mind seeing women in high heeled boots kick men in the face. That's fine, okay? Uh, if they're if they're good looking, but women should not think that it, that that is flattering to them, okay? I remember reading once about how the Barbie doll was criticized for giving young girls an, un, an unhealthy body image. Well, can you imagine what a steady diet of urban fantasies where little fashion models who weigh 96 pounds routinely beat up 250-pound linebackers give in terms of an, of an unfair body image? It makes the young girl uh, think that they can do something that they're really not that good at not not suited to do it's probably going to end badly if they ever try to too there was an anime called keiichi the greatest disciple which is about a young cowardly boy who, who who was trained by 10 or 12 crazy lunatic martial artists one of the minor characters was really interesting she was a girl who was a street fighter and she wanted to fight in a no holds barred brawl with no rules because she otherwise she could not be know for sure whether or not the guy she was fighting was throwing the match. So she had to fight in life or death situations because otherwise her pride was offended. If she, if she, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A story like that, so you can use that story. I'm, the reason I'm mentioning this is because it actually took note of the problem with having a female warrior as a main character it, and addressed it in a very clever way and gave the, main, the, the character a motivation. So, so I don't, uh, don't get me wrong, I, I certainly do not mind stories where Amazonian uh, women wearing skin-tight cat suits to go uh, throw vampires and werewolves off of burning bridges while volcanoes going off. That, that, that's, that's just cool. That's just awesome sauce. But, <laughs> I, I don't, but then you've got to make her the main character, see? And if you want to, if you want, but if you want to play to the female genius, you're going to also introduce an element of romance. If you look at the, like, the Buffy or the Angel TV shows, the main interest after seeing Buffy stake a few vampires was, well, is she going to stake her, her vampire boyfriend? I mean, it, it, romance is a more powerful, more interesting thing, more interesting plot driver than just about anything else besides, uh, I don't know, murder mysteries or something. Curiosity is one of the strongest emotions in the human art, but the desire for romance is, is equally strong. So with science fiction going forward and increasing calls for this sort of, we need strong female characters, which you rightly, I thought you rightly criticized... Do you see this as a problem going forward for science fiction? Do you think it'll be damaging if these sort of demands that it, I don't know, adheres to some ideological preconception of what it is? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I definitely do. I, I, think, I think that any time you take any art, whether noble or base, whether refined or, or popular, anything, movies, TV shows, rock and roll songs, operas, hymns, anything, statues, and you subordinate the the artistic purpose, you make the artistic purpose serve a political purpose, then you have desecrated the muse. You have offended the contract, the unspoken, unwritten contract you have with all your readers and viewers that you're going to tell them a story and it's going to entertain them. What you're doing is lying. You're saying, hey, come here, I'm going to tell you a beautiful story. I'm going to tell you a story that will make you laugh, make you cry, make you kiss ten bucks goodbye. And this story will entertain you, it'll edify you, and you sit the guy down and you say, okay, here's the story. Vote for Reagan! You know, or, or whatever, or, or vote for Woodrow Wilson. And, and then you just give him propaganda. Okay, propaganda is not storytelling. It is the opposite of storytelling. It is where you're trying to use the power of words to twist and change your audience like, like they're your patients and you're a doctor doing brain surgery on them, okay? You're lying to them. Telling a story is you trying to st strike the unseen, unremarked fetters and chains off their ankles and wrists. You're trying to set their imagination free. You're trying to show them a world that is bigger than this world. It could be bigger and filled with danger. It could be bigger and filled with fear. It could be bigger and filled with love. But it's got to be a bigger world. It's got to be something that makes the heart leap. And going, well, gee, I, I now believe in global warming. That doesn't make the heart leap. That means that you've just joined that, that group. What about something like Brave New World or 1984, which had a pretty strong message? Do you think that uh, George Orwell was trying to get us to join the Socialist Party? He was a socialist. Or was he trying to show us a world that was bigger and filled with fear than our world, a world that was shocking and astonishing? Oh, okay. I, no, I agree. He wasn't trying to get us to join the Socialist Party. Now, I will make, I'll make one exception. I'll make one exception. If your audience 
is where, is wise enough to know beforehand that they're going to hear a lecture or hear or hear a sermon rather than hear a story. That's fine with me. Some of my favorite stories were just lecture stories. Atlas Shrugged is a lecture story. Okay, the story is just a lecture. Okay, this is Anne Rand telling me her economic and moral philosophy that she's trying to persuade me to join. But I know that going in. You, you know that from the first page. What 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 you're what you're due for? Okay. Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein is just a series of lectures, and he doesn't even bother to hide the fact that it's a lecture. He has scenes where the main character, Juan Rico, goes in and says, I then went to school and heard this lecture from my professor, and then they repeat the lecture. So that's fine. If you, want to, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. But you don't need – if you're going to write a story where the main character is going to school hearing lectures about uh, feminism or uh, bimetallism or your opinions about the Caledonian War or whatever, that's, that's fine. I have no objection to that. It's the deception I object to. But I also object to something else. I also, I also have rather strong feelings about this, as strong feelings as Balkans can have, that is. And that is that political correctness is not the same as other political schools of thought. It is a, it's a religion disguised as a political movement. It's, it's, and I, when I say it's a religion, I don't mean that they believe in God. They, that whether they do or not is, in, is indifferent. It is an all-encompassing worldview, is what I mean. I mean, it's something that, to which you're supposed to devote your entire life. Okay, yeah. And it is inherently and innately undramatic. Politically correct stories are always boring, except for one. The one political correct story that's interesting is the story of the plucky rebellion against the evil overlord, the evil oppressors. Because political correctness is a narrative, is a myth, a modern myth, that says that there's a group of evil oppressors, usually the Jews, but sometimes white Christians, and there's a group of plucky rebels, whoever it might be, uh, homosexuals, blacks, women, Spaniards, Etruscans, Egyptians, uh, Irishmen, whoever it is yep. you pick as the, as the oppressed class. And the oppressed people are always completely good and completely helpless, and the oppressors are always completely evil and completely worthless. And the story is about the rebellion. Now, I'm an American. Well, we, we, we love rebellions. We got started in a rebellion. Okay? So I'm, I'm not arguing that, that a rebellion is a bad story, but I'm saying in the, in the background of the politically correctness myth, you can't tell any other stories. You can't tell a story about a martyr who dies for a, a spiritual cause because they don't believe in spiritual causes. You can't tell a story about two people from two different classes falling in love because the guys in the evil class are always completely <laughs> evil. And you can't, so you can't really tell love stories because, for one thing, that would involve a, a male and female heterosexual, which would be, you know, they, they, would, they, would, uh, uh, they always have a motive. They always have some excuse in their mind. Yeah, like Hitler's... Hitler's not a nice guy, but he thought he was doing the right thing, and he was, like, you know, like, he chose bad means. What he did was evil, but it wasn't just, he wasn't just evil for evil's sake. No one is. <laughs> it's just, but that's, that seems to be the story they want to tell. You know, the evil, the evil Koch brothers. What, what they, they just want to be evil and ruthless and crush and destroy people, and that's probably not the case. <laughs> Well, if I if I if I can alienate your your uh, your liberal liberal and left wing uh, uh, listeners, let me just say the Koch brothers were in favor of homosexual marriage before Barack Obama in America was. <laughs> so so I I don't know why they're I don't know why the left is considering them to be the epitome of evil, but I will tell you why I I, I do know why because in the the political correctness worldview has a myth and whatever can fit the myth they believe and the myth in this case is do you remember Rich Unel Uncle Pennybags from the uh, Parker Brothers Monopoly yep. game, a little, little guy with a top hat and a monocle, that is the enemy, Rich Uncle Pennybags. And anyone who can be made to look like Rich Uncle Pennybags is a bad guy. So the, the left is afraid of the Koch brothers, even though they don't know their first names, because they think it's Rich Uncle Pennybags. But they're not afraid of George Soros, a man who destroys entire financial systems for profit, because he's on their side, or because, uh, I don't know why, because logic is not their strong suit. Leftists tend to approach things in a feminine way. They, they tend to approach things trying to build a consensus and looking for secret motives. So if you argue with one, they will almost always attack your motives rather than attack your, the facts that you're saying. Right-wingers tend to be, um, even female right-wingers, tend to be more masculine in approach. They tend to look at it as a question that has certain facts, and there's a right answer and a wrong answer, and a, you know, they tend to be more confrontational. Yes. So where can we pick up Transhuman and Subhuman if we want to get a copy? And if we want to read other stuff by you, where's a good place to look? And what can we look forward to uh, in the future from John C. Wright? Well, the Transhuman and Subhuman, I have two publishers. One is Tor Books, which is the major 
science fiction publisher in the United States. And you can merely go to the Tor website and find some of my books, or you can just type in John C. Wright into Amazon. I also have a, a web page that I maintain that's called scififright.com, S-C-I-F-I-W-R-I-G-H-T.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you want to pick up Transhuman Subhuman, go to a place called Castalia House, C-A-S-T-A-L-I-A, and that's where it's for sale. You can either buy it directly there, or you can buy it through Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of the other major uh, uh, electronic publishers. It hasn't come out in, in hardback or paperback yet, and I'm not sure if the publisher has made his final decision on that. It's going to depend on sales. The other thing that uh, Castalia put out of mind was a book called Awaken the Nightland, which is the one that I mentioned that just got such astonishing, staggering reviews by it. And I realize it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm actually not. I'm actually quite... I'm kind of surprised at how, uh, uh, what, I'm actually speechless, which is really hard for me to be, if you <laughs> yeah. notice, how good the reviews are. I didn't write a book that good, but the, uh, apparently some sort of Holy Spirit has allowed people to get a much better book out of it than they, uh, than I, than I put into it. Uh, so Awaken the Nightland is also mine. There is another book, uh, called City Beyond Time, which is a collection of my Metachronopolis short stories that have also previously appeared in other anthologies and, and in magazines, but gathered together in one spot uh, here for the first time. The publisher is thinking of doing a second group of essays, nonfiction. We haven't decided on the, uh, on the timing of that yet. And uh, I have a novel, uh, a trilogy coming out, called uh, Tales of the Unwithering Realm, and the first book of that is called Some Wither. It's not for sale yet. In fact, it's not. it hasn't even been, uh, been finished <laughs> okay. yet, but that's, that's, that's for the future. Okay. Uh, Tor books, on the other hand, you can go to a bookstore right now and pick up Judge of Ages, which is my third book in my uh, Count to the Eschaton sequence, which is a space opera about a man who has to wait for his wife to come back from the globular cluster at M3, which is some 36,000 light years away, so it's going to be some 67,000 yep. uh, years round trip. The book takes place between about 200 years from now through about six, six planned volumes, which I've written four. Uh, the first three are on sale. And the, the story outline ends up with the, uh, at the end of the universe. So I'm planning on covering everything in future history from now till, till the big, the big rip. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, John C. Wright. Certainly. It was a great pleasure. Sci-Fi Show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 license. And the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.